Hello, BookTube, and welcome to June on the Range. This is a Rootin' Tootin' BookTube event created by Michael K. Vaughn last year to celebrate Westerns, Western short stories, Western novels, and it was embraced by BookTube last year, so it is back this year. And I have been enthusiastically participating. I've been reading a Western every night. I've been adding Westerns to my nightly reading every night, and varying most. I started out the month with... Uh, a lot of the cheap paperbacks that I've bought over the year waiting for June on the Range. But I want to give ebooks some credit, and I was thinking about just spinning the wheel last night to read an ebook. Uh, and I did that, and a couple of the ones that I started, I thought, oh, you know, I've had enough competent but slightly boring Western reads recently so that I'd like something a little bit different. And you can't just snap your fingers and summon up quality, which is the difference that I really wanted. So instead, when I was thumbing through all through ebook candidates, I came across something that is a reread for me. There's nothing wrong with rereads. So I reread a, a, a Western last night, and it's a romance. And it's one that I love. Uh, it's by Carolyn Brown, and it's Love Drunk Cowboy. <laughs> uh, and this is, as you can tell, a contemporary Western set in Texas. This came out in 2011. This is number one in the author's Spikes and Spurs romance series. I've read a couple of the others, and they are equally good, but nothing quite beats your introduction to the series. This is, it's so by the numbers, and yet it's done with so much conviction, so much heart, so much uh, enjoyable fizz <laughs> that I had to go back to this. It's just, a, just an absolute treat. Uh, this is the story of Austin Lanier a young woman who is an, a successful executive in the big city. She's not thinking about going back to the country to live, maybe to visit, because in the country lives her grandmother, Granny Lanier, who runs a watermelon farm. <laughs> it's not only watermelons, but also something that the first time I read this book, I think I read this in like 2015, and uh, the first time I read it, I was stunned to know that there was such a thing as watermelon wine. But apparently there is. Apparently you can ferment just about anything. <laughs> but... Uh, Unfortunately, as this novel is open, uh, Austin has received the worst possible news, which is that she will be going back to small town, town Texas. She will be going back to that watermelon farm. But it's to say goodbye to her grandmother and to dispose of her grandmother's ashes in exactly the way that her grandmother wants her to do. Uh, left record and instructions and whatnot. It's a somber opening for a romance, and uh, it gives you a hint of what this author can do. There's really no emotional register that she can't handle in this book. She can take you from somber and serious to blithe and infuriating. You often want to just smack Austin right across the face. You often want to shake some sense into her. Because she doesn't know herself what will make her happy. Which is a typical thing for romance heroines. Uh, and it's so typical that uh, an author has to work extra hard to make you feel that frustration. Right? Because you've encountered it in so many romance or even just straight up women's fiction heroines that you're used to it but now you're bored with it and uh it, it this author manages to do it she has to go to some extremes there are times in this book when austin very much does not act like uh an adult she uh, much less an adult who's had success in the business world there are times in this book a couple of them where she acts like a small child and uh that is one of the ways that this author Goose is the tension of war, of having her work against her own best interests in terms of romance, because romance is right next door, quite literally, <laughs> literally right next door. There is a rancher, uh, a rodeo star, an all-around boot-wearing, tough guy, gorgeous, dreamboat stud called Rye O'Donnell, who lives next door. He lives across the road from uh, Granny Lanier's watermelon farm. And uh, one of the neat little conceits of this book that the author, she doesn't put a whole lot of weight on it, but one of the neat little conceits of the book that she does all throughout is that Granny Lanier from the afterlife is sort of nudging these two together. That that maybe that's the one silver lining for her not being around to boss them around in person, is that she can maybe nudge them into each other's arms. And you know, this is a by-the-numbers romance novel, you know that Rye is going to have a soft spot, that he's going to have a heart of gold, that he's going to be nervous in his own way about whether or not this extremely sophisticated city girl can actually end up with a 
you know, a sod busting rodeo star like him. You feel that uh, very well. That is what I mentioned in that this author really does handle the registers well in this book. You never feel that any of them are wrong, whether you're moving from serious family dynamics to her hilarious depiction of the little old lady network of gossip. That immediately surrounds these two. <laughs> that is, it's it's just as funny the second time as it was the first time. Uh, and yes, there are a couple of kind of manufactured melodramatic moments, but there are a lot of really good melodramatic moments too that don't feel so ham-handedly manufactured. And uh, another thing that you're going to notice when you read this thing is the steadily building sexual tension, because Austin is a uh, tall glass of water, and Rye is an unbelievable stud, and they notice that about each other. They're not Cistercian monks. <laughs> they notice that about each other, and the sexual tension builds. One of the things that I love about this book, and I loved, I noticed a lot more the mechanics of how Carolyn Brown was doing it this time around, uh, is how that is played. A lot of times, especially contemporary romance, I mean, you all know I have a sweet spot for old-style Signet Regency romance, uh, which don't have this tendency at all and i it's not like i'm a prude i i know how modern romances sell and get their audiences but even so a lot of contemporary romances they just can't wait to start scorching up the sheets they can't wait to get to that part and that kind of and once you notice that an author can't wait to get to that part you feel both bored because you know they're not paying as much attention as they should to all the other parts of their story but for me anyway you also feel insulted like, I, you know, I, this isn't why you went to your MFA program. So you're, the only reason that you're hurrying to get to this part of the book must be because you think I want it and that I'm impatiently tapping my toe to get to it. When no, no, not at all. <laughs> no, I don't know that that's true for any romance reader that I know of any kind of romance. Most of them want all the rest of it. They'll take a good sizzling sex scene if you do it well. But they want all the rest of it. They want the wordplay. They want the personality interaction. They want the obstacles thrown in the path of true love, as happens in a couple of different ways in this book. They want that. They want to be swept away, not just uh, fanning themselves on the bus. <laughs> I, fir I firmly believe that's true with every romance reader that I've ever known. Uh, and this author gives us that, which is really nice. By the time uh, the fireworks go off, <laughs> we, feel, we feel ready for it. We feel, we feel invested. Uh, so I was I was happy to read Love Drunk Cowboy again for June on the Range. I was happy to do it. There is no enormous romance booktube event like June on the Range that I know of. I floated the idea many times to my partner in crime, Sarah, at the Bookish Midor. I've Many times I've said, surely we should have such a thing, and surely it should be you and me that does it. We have a second channel for category romances, but what about one big thing, one big romance event? Uh, I don't think such a thing exists that is just to all comers, for all readers of all kinds of romance. But uh, this will certainly do for June on the Range. I don't think there's any metric by which you cannot call Rye O'Donnell a cowboy. I don't think there's any metric by which you cannot call this a Western. Uh, it takes place in the West. It has all sorts of Western folklore and uh, urban legends scattered all throughout it. It's very Western feel to it. And it was what I needed. It was the change of pace that I needed, so I gave it to myself anyway. I will go back to 50-year-old uh, guys writing on a 10 pseudonyms, writing 300 books tonight. <laughs> I will go back to that tonight, probably. But I gave myself uh, a little out from that with Love Drunk Cowboy, a second time through. A rare re I almost never reread romances. And this was a rare reread for me that worked wonderfully. So just what I needed as a palate cleanser. So I, I certainly recommend Love Drunk Cowboy. If you read romances and you haven't got to it, you're really going to like it. I don't know off the top of my head if Sarah likes it. I can't imagine that she wouldn't uh, if, she, if she hasn't read it. But I, I'm, she probably has read it. So anyway, uh, that is my uh, June on the Range entry for today. A little bit uh, out of the ordinary. Uh, it's not often in Westerns that the, main, the two main characters eventually end up wrangling in the sheets. Although some of the 1950s pulpy westerns that I have read in June on the Range this year could only have benefited from such a thing. <laughs> Just saying. Uh, but anyway, I'm going to wrap this up, but I'll be back. Thank you, book two.